Disclaimer, the overarching views and research in this article are all based on a biblical worldview. The intent is to not damage anyone else's beliefs, but simply consider the alternative of the reality you presently believe. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 16 through 18 from the Bible, the reader is shown the account of an unclean spirit that is empowering a fortune teller's fortune telling ability. Through Paul's belief and confidence in Jesus Christ, he himself was empowered to cast it out. The following excerpt is from the English Standard Version. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. Now, when I first heard this narrative, I immediately thought about popularized mediums in media, such as Long Island Medium, crossing over with John Edwards and Sylvia Brown. Now, from my observation, networks that host shows with mediums play to the curiosities of people who crave to understand the supernatural and unknown. Most psychics and mediums seem to have well intentions. If you're a griever from the loss of a loved one, then I understand the desperation to speak with them just one more time. I completely understand. You want to see them again. That is understandable feeling. All right. But let's continue. For those people who believe mediums can communicate with dead human beings, suggesting that their ghost is still lingering post-death, I ask you a really good question. Who are they really speaking to based on the above biblical account? Now, we witnessed talk show hosts and audience members gush and adore these spiritual wonders. Before I became a Christian, I desired for my own behind the veil fascination to be tickled. In 2007, before I seriously sought God, I casually sought a fortune teller. I was with a former girlfriend at the time and we were wildflowers, very open to experiencing everything life had to offer, even if it meant engaging in activities that spat in God's face. My family background provided me with the decorum of belief. My dad was instilled in my brother and me several tenets, you know, things like don't play with God or do not get tattoos or you're desecrating the skin God blessed you with. And a little side note. Now, this sounded more serious because he used the word desecrating, which I knew in my ignorance had to be serious to God. To this day, tattoos never happened. And all because my dad used the word desecrating, which I was like, that has to be severe, heavy. Now, these fire and brimstone statements weren't much, but they offered some form of restraint when we weren't around our parents. However, as the world got a hold of me, these things would wear off as I considered getting a tattoo and even labeled myself as spiritually agnostic. Honestly, since the Simpsons portrayal of Christianity through Ned Flanders, nice ladies who only had church bake sales and spiritually strict elder black women who appeared to never have any fun, I thought Christianity was for chumps and cornballs, just based on those things. If my memory serves me correctly, it was a warm summer night, August, I believe. It was a date night, and I, not her, wanted to try something different. Now, I received a reading into impending doom, oh, excuse me, into my future based on some tarot cards and the lines in my palms from this fortune teller. Now, I was surprised by the, the Tom Hanks big Zotar outcome. You'll meet a mysterious man who will mentor you on business. You will become rich and famous. Yes, but wait. I then asked her about my relationship with my ex. Hmm. I don't have anything to tell you. So, I guess I have to be the one to break the news to her. My ex and I broke up at the top of 2008. I was a cheater and didn't necessarily see a maritally blissful future with her. I saw it coming from a mile away. When we left, I wondered, who told this lady this? 
was it God whispering in her ear or merely a good spirit? I adopted a universalist belief dependent on good person theology. In death, I will be rewarded for my good deeds and efforts aligned with my good person definition. I drove home that night feeling elated, but bothered. Could I trust in who or what she trusted? Now, the first time I encountered the use of the word familiars was when I played Castlevania Symphony of the Night back in 1997. They are entities that follow Al Alucard, excuse me, the son of Dracula, around aiding in his quest to destroy his father. When I heard the term as a Christian, I recalled Castlevania Symphony of the Night and the familiars in the forms of an imp, a spiritual sword, a fairy, and a floating ghost specter, which was a blue flaming skull head more specifically. I thought about what they were and how they operated. They follow Alucard around. Now, I know that the game possibly pulls from what we consider myths and wise tales, yet I still have to ask, could it be that there are spirits who follow us around taking note of every little detail of our lives? In the Easton's Bible Dictionary from Blue Letter Bible Online, the word familiar is from the Latin term, and I'm going to butcher this, so bear with me, familiar eris familiar heiress i think that's how you pronounce it but anyway meaning it's a household servant and was intended to express the idea that sorcerers had spirits as their servants ready to obey their commands the eastern's bible dictionary also defines such spirit as an inspiring demon these mediums were identified as necromancers who conjured the dead to answer questions now one most notable account of this occurs in first samuel chapter 28 verses 6 through 19 when God turned the blind eye to King Saul's cry for help, in his desperation, King Saul consults with the witch of Endor, seeking answers about his upcoming confrontation with the Philistines. And the scripture reads, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring him up to me, whom I shall name unto thee. In the Hebrew translation, this woman was identified as an oob or oob, which translates into leathern bottle, for sorcerers were regarded as vessels containing the inspiring demon. Now, could it be that our modern mediums are nothing more than necromancers with a fresh coat of paint? The narrative continues in scripture. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said to, unto her, be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascended out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. The surprise reaction of the witch endorses the fact that deceiving spirits are initially communicating with her. She beheld the literal spirit of Samuel after the Lord intervened, allowing Saul to see demonstrating that real human spirits are not the ones communicating witches, mediums, etc. Throughout the Old Testament and New Testaments, we are warned not to seek the counsel of seducing spirits as God wants to be our only source of guidance and instruction. Selena Gomez appeared on Jimmy Fallon back in 2015. She demonstrated an app that supposedly could collect the white noise of spirits, ghosts, in whatever location you're in. Chris Hudson from the Forerunner Chronicles YouTube addressed the moment brilliantly with scriptural support in the same vein that I'm, I'm striving to do right now. Watch as Selena Gomez introduces this supernatural app to Jimmy Fallon. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to debate okay, you on this. I believe in it. I think it's real. Well, I didn't say anything. There's my phone. Okay, that's your phone. Jabasoff? Yes. So ghost you, hunter. Yes. Oh, I don't want to kill the ghost. No, 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 no. Oh, so no. It's working. It's working. So. Wait, is that me? That's my voice. Am I a ghost? <laughs> it's reading. It's recording my voice. No, it's not recording your voice. But why see the green things going up now when I'm talking? Because just in case there are spirits. Oh. I just heard something. 
What does that mean? Wait, what does that mean? That means there's one. There's one goat. Up. Oh. There's two goats. Yep. Now, in this next video clip of America's Got Talent, Mike Super was invited to perform with what AGT identified as his imaginary friend, Desmond. Now, if you look in the comment section of that video, you'll also see that Mike Super himself pent, or I think America's Got Talent, pent his comment and reinforced that Nick Cannon's involvement was not scripted and even jokes that you can't have Desmond without the letters M and E, and if you remove the S and D, it gets scarier. Check it out. 11 plus 1 is 12. Plus 5. 17. Plus 6. 23. 23. Desmond has created a Zodiac calendar based off of your We Have Had contact. Thank you. Wow. This video further cements that the spiritual realm is not a game or a figment of someone else's great imagination. Now, Mike Super's life experience would be a prime example of a familiar being involved in his life. What power then does Christianity have when dealing with unclean spirits? And if people such as Mike Super can manipulate reality through that of a suspicious spirit, now how are Christians empowered? To whom are we communicating with also? In the following video clips, you're going to see three accounts of men who were practicing witchcraft and Satanism. In their conjuring or spell casting, they experience unexpected roadblocks when encountering true believing Christians. Stephen Dollins, a former high priest Satanist, discusses how one person's true belief in Jesus Christ repelled a demon summoned by him. I got to tell you a story. I got to tell you. I got to tell you this because if, if you're born again Christian, you're spirit filled. I mean, you need to know how powerful the name of Jesus is. You do, you do. You need to know about the blood of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we summoned up a spirit, and the reason we did that is one of the one night, one of the witches came in, one of the young witches came in, and she said, there's a lady down the street who's a Christian, and she's, she's threatening to expose us, threatening to expose our group. And I said, well, we've got the police department and the sheriff's department. I mean, there's no problem there. She goes, no, you don't understand. She's going to tell my mother. I said, oh, we can't have that. She said, no. If she tells my mother, she said, my mother will make me quit. I said, oh, okay. Well, what do you want us to do? Well, let's just hurt her a little bit. Let's put a hex on her. Not a big one, just a little one. I said, oh, you mean send something after her just to make something happen to let her know we're there? She said, yes. Okay, we can do that. So what we did is we got in the circle and we summoned up a spirit named Astaroth. Now, uh, this is supposed to be one of the hierarchy of the demons. And over in the side of the room, this orange cloud started appearing. And as it appeared, there started appearing a face out of that cloud. And guess what face it was? The wolf man. The thing that I'd been afraid of ever since I was a little kid. So I'm sitting there trying to make people think that, hey, I'm cool, you know, nothing wrong with me. I didn't want to show fear in front of my people, you know, <laughs> my followers. And so all of a sudden, this, this cloud started appearing, and we told it what we wanted it to do. We sent it off, and it was gone. We came out five minutes later, came out of the circle, everybody talking, having a good time. We were getting ready to break the meeting up. All of a sudden, this orange cloud started appearing in the side of the room again. And I looked at it, and I said, oh, everybody back in the circle, quick. We got back in the circle, and this, cl this cloud appeared again. This time, this thing was in a rage. I mean, it was angry. And it spoke to me just like I'm speaking to you tonight. I mean that audibly. And it said, don't you ever send me after a Christian again. And I'm telling you, I mean, that's, that's the power. This, this woman must have had the blood of Jesus all over her. Oh, hallelujah. You know, must have had the blood of Jesus all over her. Must have even, even anointed her house or had protective angels outside or something, you know. I think that was probably my biggest turning point. Because I'm sitting there now thinking, wait a minute. We're supposed to be the ones in control. We're supposed to have all the power. And all of a sudden, here's a demon spirit telling us don't send it after Christians? What's going on? In this next clip from a 2012 CBN released the testimony of John Ramirez, who speaks on his experience with Santeria. And the clip... He talks about astral projecting from his body, flying over neighborhoods, speaking curses into them. Yet there was one area where his attempt was completely nullified. Eventually, John became a high priest in Palo Mayambe, a form of African spiritualism. 
As he became more powerful, John took warfare seriously. The devil told me that I had to go into the neighborhood in the spirit round in order to weaken it in the natural. Whatever you kill in the spirit round, you can kill in the natural. So I will leave my body home and I should project myself into a different borough, different region, different states, different countries. And as I fly in the neighborhood, I would speak curses into the neighborhood, speak things that I wanted to happen into the neighborhood. Sometimes I will go into neighborhoods and I see this group of people in the spirit line in the corner praying, holding hands, heads bowed, praying up a storm. And there was no accomplishment in that neighborhood. In that neighborhood was sanctified, blessed through prayer. There was, you couldn't touch it. But the other neighborhoods, it was party time. In this last clip, Bill Schneblin, a man who held many high-ranking positions throughout many pseudo-religions, recalls a woman who wrote, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus on a check he was about to deposit to the Church of Satan. Now, he wasn't ready for what was about to happen next in his life. Let's roll the footage. The funny thing is, is along the way, I asked for, for help. And I, I was asking for it for, from the devil. But the funny thing is, is some way, sometimes Yahweh will come along when you're praying to the wrong deity, and he'll say, excuse me, I'll take this call. And that's just what he did. He answered that prayer. Because what happened was, is that all of a sudden, <clears throat> I got a check back. Every year I was sending a check to the Church of Satan, my dues. And I got it back from the bank, and some lady from the San Francisco Bank, where the Church of Satan does its banking, had written on it, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus. And I just, I just thought that was so inane, because at this point I was so deceived. I thought Jesus was the son of Satan. He'd been killed on the cross as a sacrifice to the evil god Jehovah to save mankind from enslavement. That's how 180 degrees off I was. So I just laughed and, you know, forgot about it. Well, the funny thing was, within a couple of days, something hit me like a Mack truck. I lost all my magical power. I got sick as a dog. I lost all my vampiric power. It was like I was flat on my face. You know, I felt like I was hitting bottom big time. And I couldn't figure out what was going on, you know. And so I kept saying, you know, Lucifer, you promised me that if I did all these things for you, I would have all this power, all of this wealth, women, whatever, you know. And here I am basically ruined, you know, because that's what he is. He's a welcher. The devil will promise you anything and then deliver virtually nothing. And the funny thing was is, who should come up from Milwaukee, if pardon me, from Chicago to visit us in Milwaukee? A couple of teenage satanic groupies who wanted to meet the great Magister Templi, that was me, who at that time I was so sick as a dog I could barely sit in my chair and look impressive. And so they came in and they said, we brought you these Christian comic books because they're so funny. There's one book called Spellbound and one book called Angel of Light and they're about the occult and they're so stupid, you know. And they'd even written obscene things in them and like made black the teeth out on the characters in the book and stuff. So anyway, I just glanced at them, pff, couldn't be bothered. The interesting thing was, is in all those years, we lived 10 years in Milwaukee, no Christian ever came and witnessed to us. Not even a Jehovah Witness came and witnessed to us. Not even the Mormons came to visit us. We lived in the same place in the heart of downtown Milwaukee. Never. So that's what Yahweh had to do. He had to have Satanists bring me the gospel. Because at that time, in the, and still to this day, in the back of those comic books, it was how to get born again. But I couldn't be bothered. I had too much ego. You know, they say it's the hardest thing of all is for someone who's prideful to get saved. And I was full of pride. When true believers exercise their faith and belief in Jesus Christ, the reality of the Bible will manifest at scale. At minimum, people have a sense of a higher power existing, whether it's the right higher power or not. James chapter 2 verse 9 reads, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. The only variable separating the believer from the non-believer is the blood of Jesus Christ that is over our lives. Christians still have the same struggles, but with the blessed hope in Jesus Christ, we have a resource that allows us to change before the eyes of men, despite still physically being contained in sinful flesh. There is a consequence when you interrupt a person's perception of reality. 
whether it's right or wrong, if truth is presented that threatens the fragility of what they know, by default, you will be in harm's way. This is the walk of a Christian. This is hardcore when the same truth dares to destroy one's sources of legal or illegal income. In Acts chapter 16 verses 19 through 21, excellently illustrates the behavior of people when you interfere on their dirty little hustle. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when he had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Once that unclean spirit departed the fortune teller, she lost her ability to bring fortunes to her supposed pimps. These guys wanted revenge in a worse way, canceling Paul and Silas through lies and false accusations. Sound familiar in today's times, doesn't it? The more things change, the more they actually stay the same. In closing, maybe you consulted a fortune teller as they predicted that you would become a millionaire and it came to pass. Or you're a person who talked to a loved one that you have been, give, have been grieving over for quite some time through a medium. The assumed supernatural conversation bought you closure as to the hereafter. Sinful activities are perceived as innocent because they make us feel good or appear to have benefited our lives one way or another. You may feel like those same con artists are ready to cancel me after reading this expose. I understand if you are upset, yet I'm praying you have watched this with an open mind to do your own research. And we are sinful beings, naturally from the womb. As Psalms chapter 51 verse 5 reads, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Since Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, we left one origin to accept another. We're not born as good little boys and girls, no matter how beautiful and untainted we appeared as babies. It takes proper teaching and correction to redirect us on the path God wants us on eventually to become born again, to return to our intended origin. Jesus Christ wants to be our wonderful counselor, making our steps righteous while we're here. When our time is up, who do you think you'll be speaking to or become in the afterlife? Last time I checked in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, it says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. No matter how friendly the paranormal may seem, there are no Casper, the friendly ghost in existence here on earth.